Well, good evening, Castle Hill Baptist Church, and uh, wherever you are at the moment, uh, I trust that you are looking forward to hearing uh, from the Lord tonight. I just want to make an announcement first. Uh, next Sunday evening, we're going to be having a Q&A discussion panel with the pastors. Uh, so tonight, just making the announcement, if you've got any kind of theological questions that are burning in your mind or any kind of world issues that are pertain to the scriptures or how the scriptures view things, uh, jot those questions down. Now send an email of that question to the office uh, this week or text the question to one of the pastors. And then next week, depending on how many we get and how many we can get through, uh, next Sunday evening we'll have that Q&A discussion panel to answer some of those questions. So lock that away. Even if you think of some now, jot them down and uh, send them through to one of the pastors or email it uh, to the church office. Tonight uh, we jump back in, Missions Emphasis Week is over, so we jump back into the study of the Gospel of John. We're really at the tail end. We've got maybe three, I think, sermons left on it. So we're right at the end. Uh, just to jog your memory, uh, a few weeks ago Pastor Ian was preaching and he, and he spoke on the empty tomb and uh, we saw that Mag Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, saw it was empty, went to go tell the disciples, Peter and John uh, both ran to the tomb and Peter looked in and John looked in and it says that John believed and that's where we left off. Tonight, uh, we are really privileged to see some insights into the resurrection that only the Gospel of John records. Uh, so there's some real precious details here given to us by the Holy Spirit and we're going to see some glimpses of the Prince of Peace uh, tonight specifically. So uh, I encourage you, if you've got a Bible, please uh, open up on your phone so you can follow along as we work through the text. Uh, you'll see that it's quite a difficult text, but the Lord will help us. So John chapter 20, and we're going to read verses 10 to 23. So John uh, chapter 20, verses 10 to 23. It reads, Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two disciples in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Verse 19, On that evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said this, or after he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What a passage that we have. He who has ears, let him hear the words of the Lord. Let's pray together as we uh, ask for the Lord's help. Our Father uh, who art in heaven, we come before you tonight. And uh, God, we just thank you that we have your word that is here left with us, that we have this time now to dig its depths and to hear from you. This is how you speak to us. So we thank you for this time of communion with you. God, these great words in this passage that's been left for us, we need to understand them with our minds. 
but Father, we need to be gripped uh, by them in our hearts. Lord, we need to be moved. We need to be transformed. We need to be shaken. We need to be lifted up. We need to see the glory and the majesty in them. They need to confront us. We need our lives redirected and reshifted with the focus. God, we say to you even now, speak for your servants are listening. Help us to hear what you have to say about your son in your word tonight, we pray. May you breathe upon us the spirit that we might be powerfully worked upon as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing I want us to uh, consider tonight from these verses is the believer's unnecessary sorrow. The believer's unnecessary sorrow. We see this in the first number of verses there. Peter and John had run uh, to the tomb, but they saw nobody, nobody of Jesus. And so it says in the text, they went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Now, this is Mary Magdalene, just to refresh your memory. But look at verses 11 to 13. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Now, the emphasis on these verses here is, uh, is on uh, the moment of Mary, and the emphasis is on her crying and weeping. You'll notice there in these verses, three times it mentions that Mary is crying. It draws attention that she's crying, and the Greek word here is weeping, uh, real grief here. So these are real tears of Mary. This is real uh, anguish that she's experiencing. And this is where the attention is drawn on the text. Now Mary is devastated and and this day added more grief to her than she ever thought that it could have. Now on Friday, she had just witnessed, a couple of days earlier, she just witnessed her master crucified. Now how different was her view of Calvary than than ours today as we look back towards Calvary. She she witnessed the horror of her master and Lord being crucified unjustly. It was traumatic visions. It was a horrendous sight. It caused great grief to her soul. Her hopes were dashed. She was gutted. We look back with joy knowing the meaning of it. But Calvary was a very different experience for her. And now, just a few days later, the Sabbath is finally over. Saturday's passed and it's Sunday. And she wants to go to the tomb to be able to mourn for her Lord, to be able to do this, to be able to grieve through this process and mourn for him. Even that is now denied of her because she sees that the body is missing. She can't even mourn for him. So it seems that everything has been taken from her. Her grief is incredible. Not only did the religious leaders and the crowds kill her Lord, but now it seems that someone's stolen his body. And so Mary, in these points, she is beside herself. So even when she sees the angels in the tomb, she says to them, they've taken my Lord. It's as if she's saying, they have taken everything from me. He was everything to me and they've taken him completely from me. So Mary is weeping. But the, author, the authors of the gospel accounts, the gospel records, by the Holy Spirit, they want us to see something and learn something that's, that's happening here. There's a lesson for us. And each of the writers tie together. John says she looks into the tomb and the angels speak asking her, why are you crying? Now, what does Luke's account say? In 24 verse 5 of Luke, the angels say, Again, the angel speaking, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you that the Son of Man must be delivered to sinful men, crucified, and then on the third day raised. Now, what does Matthew say in chapter 28, verse 5? The angels speak to Mary again, and it says, you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said told you you see mary is weeping while all of heaven is rejoicing is it fitting to be weeping 
while a victory has just taken place. You do not mourn. You should not be mourning on Easter. That's not that. That shouldn't be the case. And so the the angels here are, are asking her when they say, uh, "Why are you crying?" What what they're really saying to her is, "Don't you remember what he told you?" In other words, you are weeping because you forget his words. Really, you shouldn't be crying. You should have been counting down the hours to this moment. And so the angels say, don't you remember what he said? That's the harmony of these records. And there's so much for us to learn in this. How much needless sorrow and grief do we carry and allow ourselves to experience because we forget his word. We forget his word. We forget what he has said and what he has promised. We are downcast and we are broken hearted because he, we forget what he has said. Are you full of sorrow and misery because at the present time the Lord has laid you down on a bed of sickness? Well, Jesus says, in the world you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. Or are you grieved and confused by all the evil that you see around the world, especially at this present time? The scriptures say that Satan is the god of this world, the ruler of this age. Why are you surprised to see the world as it is when they are just following the tune of the great Pied Piper? Are you, are you treated at work? Are you treated unjustly or are you ostracized for your faith and it causes you great sorrow and confusion? Jesus said to us, a servant is not greater than the master. If they treated me this way, they will reject and treat you also likewise. Uh, has, has faith brought division? Your, your personal faith, has it brought division in your family, in your marriage, in, in, with, amongst your relatives? Is that causing you great sorrow and grief? Don't you remember that Jesus says, understand this. He, he, he said, I have come to bring division. I will turn a household against each other, a father against their son, a daughter against their mothers. The house will be split because of me. I did not come to bring family peace. Is life just really difficult and hard for you at the moment? It's just hard to be a Christian. It's really hard to be a Christian. Well, the scriptures tell us through many tribulations and troubles, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. And has God not perhaps fulfilled the requests that you've been asking for so long and it causes you grief and misery and sorrow? The scriptures say, Godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, we are to remember his words. Surely Mary isn't alone in this. Forgetting what Jesus has said, forgetting what the words are. Are we not the same? Angels are God's ministers. They are his messengers, the scriptures say. But how often do these messengers of God look at our lives and they see us crying and in misery and they say to themselves, child of God, child of the Most High, why are you crying? You are crying because you forget what he said. Don't you remember what his word says? I cannot impress upon you enough how important it is to have the Word of God regularly a part of our lives. It must be in and through us, feeding upon it. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's not a cute saying. It's not something to just put in a picture frame or put on a Hallmark card. How often do we not live because we do not eat of his word? Much of our trouble, isn't it a result of distance from his word? We cry, God, God, why? Why this? Why that? And we're sorrowful and we're miser miserable and all because our Bibles are shut. We, the knowledge of God is sealed up. Comfort and help that is available to us sits collecting dust and we cry in misery. And so they say, woman, why are you weeping? He told you. He told you. 
But something incredible happens now that only John records. The conversation with the angels is interrupted and it's almost as if Mary senses them looking over her shoulder because someone else has appeared. Look at verse 14. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was him. She sees Jesus, but she doesn't recognize it's him. How could she not recognize that it was her Lord. Later on in the text it says she thought he was the gardener. How could she not recognize it's him? We don't really know why this is. Uh, was there just too much grief, too much tears in her eyes? Was she just not in her right mind? Was Jesus at a distance somewhat covered? Could be any of those reasons. But it seems like she was restricted from, for, from seeing for a moment. Just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they talked and walked with Jesus after the resurrection for miles and they didn't even know they were talking to Jesus. There was some kind of restriction upon their eyes. But notice she doesn't initiate the conversation he does. Look at verse 15. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Did you notice again the the mention of why are you crying? Why are you crying? Even after seeing the angels, she sees angels and she's still crying. She's still weeping. She's not satisfied with seeing angels. She's not satisfied with a glorious supernatural encounter. She's after one and one alone. My Lord. That's what she says. She's ignorant of what's going on. She's ignorant of who's in front of her. But her longings, the longings of her heart, her affections are for Jesus, not for angels. This is who she wants. And so even after she sees the angels, she leaves the tomb crying for Jesus. What a picture. You see, her faith is weak, but her love is unquenchable. No wonder Jesus chooses her to be the first one that he reveals himself to after his resurrection. Jesus, though, you notice, doesn't initially unveil himself. And and notice he doesn't challenge her love when he speaks to her, but rather he challenges her faith. That's where the lacking is. And he challenges her faith with a twofold question that you see there in verse 15. He repeats what the angels ask, why are you crying? And this is him uh, as if to say kind of what they were implying and what it said in the other accounts. Don't you remember what I said to you? Why are you crying? And then his challenge goes further. He says to her next with a follow-up question, who is it that you are looking for? Now, what a searching and challenging question that is, because she has gone looking for a dead Jesus, for the corpse of Jesus, when she should have been looking for the victorious conqueror of death. And so he challenges her faith. But Mary doesn't get the challenge that the angels have made to her, and she doesn't get the challenge that Jesus makes to her faith now. And it says in the text, her response is she, th- she thinks that he's the gardener. And she just says, are you the one that's taking him away? Do you know where he is so that I can go and get him and bring him back? What's going on? She's still desperately looking for the corpse of Jesus. Yet it is next that we see one of the most beautiful moments recorded in all of the Gospels. One of the highlights of of what happened in Jesus' three years of ministry. Look at verse 16. Jesus then said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. One word and the veil was removed. One word, and the scales fell from her eyes. And isn't it interesting that the one word that did it wasn't Jesus' name. It was her name. Why is that? What's going on here? All he said was Mary. Why is it that that's done it? 
Well, there is a beautiful thing happening here. This is a living example of a spiritual truth that Jesus taught in John chapter 10. Jesus said this, I am the good shepherd. The sheep listen to my voice and I call them by name and I lead them out. And and this is exactly what we see here. Mary thought she came looking for Jesus, but Jesus came looking for her. And he comes to seek her and then he calls her and she hears him. You see, she lacked faith. She forgot his word. There was no reason why she should be crying. But Jesus wasn't harsh with her. He didn't cast her off. He He wasn't crushing her. But he stoops down and he calls her by name. This is so precious. In the Old Testament, even in Isaiah chapter 43, it says, God says to Israel, Israel, I have summoned you by name. But now every sheep in God's flock, every Christian is called and known by name, summoned by name. You see, he knows all of the galaxies and he knows all of the stars that he exists. And yet he knows us by name and he calls each one of us by name. It's wonderful. And so, yes, Christian, the King immortal, the King of glory, the Son of God, he calls you and he knows you by name. It's wonderful. And so Mary worships. And is there anything else fitting for this moment? But I want to show you, it only gets better. It only gets better. What's better than being called by name from Jesus? What's better than that? Well, next we see the believer's great privilege. In the next few verses, the believer's great privilege. Look at verse 17 to 18. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me. For I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now Mary must have, when he called her name and she realized, she must have fallen to the ground and clung to him with all of her might. She watched him die before her very eyes and now she's been desperate just to get to his corpse and yet now here he stands alive right in front of her calling her by name so what does she do she holds on to him she latches onto him she thought she lost him for good and now she grabs him you see the picture here the imagery is you know those scenes when a wife, she hasn't heard back reports on how her husband is doing in a war. She hasn't heard any news and she presumes he's dead. She's already mourning for him. And then one day she receives an unexpected knock at the door. And who does she see standing there alive right in front of her? Her husband, whom she concluded was dead, now alive. And what does that wife do? She grabs onto him with all of her might. That's what you have here. That's what you have here. And she holds on and grabs Jesus. But Jesus' response is surprising. He says to her, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. This beautiful moment, it's almost like Jesus cuts her off and interrupts a beautiful moment. Now, what's going on here? The, unfortunately, our NIV, the, the original NIV, has is not got an accurate translation here. The NIV uh, states that Jesus says, "I have not yet returned to the Father." That's not the Greek word there. The Greek word is, "I have not yet ascended." I have not ascended yet to the Father. Now, most, pretty much every single English translation gets that right. You can even look at it. Each of the translations say "ascended." Now, why am I bringing this up? It's not a matter of just picking up and fighting with words. But that word return, if you translate this, I have not yet returned to the Father, it can massively change the meaning of this passage. See, if Jesus hasn't yet returned to the Father, where has he been these past three days that he died? Where is he? Where has he been these three days if he hasn't been back to the Father yet? So this, is, this, this view here has been pounced on and, and by many people in Christianity, especially Pentecostal and charismatic movements. 
Now they see this and, and, and based on other things, they promote this heresy that when Jesus died, he descended into hell. He went to hell and there he suffered for three days to continue to pay and fully pay for sin, for our sin. So he had to also go to hell. That is wrong. And that is a, that is a heretical teaching. Because the scriptures say, Jesus, when he's on the cross, he says to the thief next to him, Today, that's on Friday, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what he says there. And then when he dies, he says, it is finished. I don't have to pay for anything in hell, it's finished. But he says, on Friday, you'll be with me in paradise to the dying thief. But you see, when this verse is translated correctly as ascended, The meaning makes perfect sense. See, when Jesus had died, his spirit went into the presence of God, into paradise. But Jesus' body remained in the tomb. His body was dead in the tomb while his spirit was present with the Lord. So now, at this point, when he's speaking to Mary, he hasn't yet ascended into heaven as the God-man. He hasn't ascended into heaven with resurrected body. He hasn't done that yet. And so he, as he says this to her, there's a lesson for Mary here. Jesus wouldn't be staying on earth now. He, He wasn't here to set up an earthly kingdom now. It's not what he was going to do. He wasn't going to stay with them and live among them like he was before, like the disciples enjoyed him. And so he's saying, don't hold on to me. Don't cling to me. Don't keep me back from where I will be going. It's not going to be the same as before. He was to be exalted to the right hand of God. And we'll see that this is important soon in the verses coming. It was necessary that he needed to ascend because there was something that needed to continue. But verse 17 is glorious. Instead of holding on to me, he he says there in verse 17 to Mary, Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Now when you read that, you really should be asking the question, why does Jesus call God his God? Jesus says, I'm going back to my God. Isn't Jesus God as well? Well, the answer to this is tucked away in these words, and it is the answers in these words here. Jesus says, go to my brothers and tell them. Now, that Greek word there is accurately translated, brothers. Go to my brothers. Now, in the New Testament, we continually read in the epistles, in the letters, uh, Christians are called brothers in Christ. Now, that word their brothers refers to male Christians and female Christians. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we're actually used to calling one another uh, a brother or sister. You're my brother or sister in Christ. We're used to doing that. But are you used to calling Jesus your brother? Are you used to doing that? Because in this passage, Jesus calls us his brothers, his brothers and sisters. This is what he's saying in this verse. Now, I'm not here creating or inventing some new kind of teaching here. This is, this is, is uh, found elsewhere in Scripture. Hebrews 2, 11 to 12, it says this, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name, O God, to my brothers. See, Jesus now calls us his brothers. How is he our brother? How how is he our brother? Well, he when he descended, he took on flesh and he became a man, a person like us, a human. Now he does not lose his deity. But what he does is he adds to his deity another nature. To his divine nature, he adds another nature, a human nature. And so he becomes one of us. He takes upon himself in his life on earth a body of weakness like us. He suffers grief and trouble and sorrow and hunger. He suffers all of these things. And and so truly, he is the son of God. He is the king of glory. He is the judge of all the earth. And at the same time now, he is our elder brother. He is. 
He's our elder brother. This is something that the Son of God was not in the Old Testament. He was never a brother to the people. But since he's taken on flesh and humanity, he has now become our elder brother. This is amazing. And so he becomes like us by taking on humanity. And and he becomes a man. And so now he can say, as the God-man... He can say, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Being one of us as a brother, he calls God his God. And he brings us to God. And he who could always call God Father, he now allows us by his work on the cross to call God our Father. And he becomes our older brother, the Lord Jesus. Isn't this amazing? What a new open door and a new dimension this brings to how we pray and commune with Jesus. Viewing him and praying to him and talking to him as also our older brother. What, what a difference this makes to our relationship and our awe of him and how we can relate to him when we now begin to see him in terms as also our elder brother. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And Jesus tells Mary to share this with the disciples. Verse 18. So Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Jesus entrusts her to be the first one to share the Easter message. She's the first one. But not only that, not only share that she's seen him, but also it says in that verse, and she told them he had said these things to her. Go and tell my brothers. She told them, Jesus told me that. And go and tell my brothers that I'm ascending to God, your God, my father, your father. And she does. Well, thirdly, I want us to see now the believer's confidence and peace. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. The believer's confidence and peace. Look at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now fast forward to, fast forward to the evening, the same day. It's now Sunday night. Peter and John have seen the empty tomb. John believed Mary had seen the risen Jesus and she'd shared this with the disciples. But the disciples' fear is greater than their belief. And the Jews who had put an end to Jesus, they knew that. They killed Jesus. The disciples now feel that they're going to have the same fate. And it says, so they locked the doors of their home out of fear of the Jews. They thought that they would be the next ones to be killed. And yet locked doors... Locks and walls, they can't keep the resurrected Lord Jesus out. And it says he appears. And so he appears in this midst, in their midst. And, and Jesus, who is now resurrected, he can come and go as he pleases. Pastor Ian's talked about this for the last number of months. I'm not going to elaborate on that. The new resurrected Jesus doesn't have these limitations. So yes, this is showing us his glorified body, but it's also showing us something else. His heart for his people, his heart for his brothers and sisters. Remember, this appearance is on the same day that he was raised. It's the night of the day that he was raised. This is interesting. He comes to them the same day that he rises from the dead. He doesn't want to delay. He doesn't want to keep them waiting. He doesn't want to leave them locked away in a room, trembling for their lives. So he comes to them on the same day because he loves them. Because he loves them. They're his brothers and sisters. Now, there are a couple important details here. His first words to them when he appears, interestingly, is, Peace be with you. Now, this is the customary Jewish greeting, shalom, which means peace. But the word is even more rich than that. The word shalom means wholeness and completeness. It's basically saying, may the full blessing of God, the smile of God be upon you. It's almost saying, may the Lord make his face shine upon you. That's what this greeting encapsulates. So Jesus gives them this customary greeting of shalom, peace be with you. 
But there is so much more here that he's doing than just a customary Jewish greeting. There's so much more because three times he says to them, peace be with you. Look, end of verse 19. He appeared, stood among them and said, peace be with you. Look at verse 21. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then jump down, verse 26, Jesus comes to them again in the house on another occasion, stands among them and says, peace be with you. Three times there is repetition here. Jesus is intentionally communicating something here. The Holy Spirit through through the author John is trying to communicate something here. What is this peace with you? What's the meaning going on here? Well, firstly, he wants to calm their fears. They're scared of the Jews. They're scared they're going to die. They're trembling. And so he assures them with his presence and says, peace, I'm here. But secondly, this is because of his resurrection, there is now peace with God for them through his blood. And he achieved this through his shed blood on the cross. There's many verses to say this. So at his birth, when Jesus was first born, the angels announced from heaven to the shepherds, peace on earth to men whom God has favor upon. And then when Jesus rises from the dead, his first words to the disciples are, peace be with you. The same message. See, this message of peace ends up being the bookend of the whole work that Christ did on the cross and his resurrection. When he's on the cross on Friday, he says, it is finished. On Sunday, when he rises, he says, peace be with you. It sums it all up. And peace becomes a central pillar, a foundation on the Christian message. It, peace is foundational to Christianity. That's why every single one of Paul's letters in the New Testament, it opens with the words, peace be to you, peace from God. Every single letter. See, Jesus brings, for the first time in history, he brings true the fulfillment of shalom to people. For the first time, shalom, peace and the blessing and the smile of God, that peace with God, that wholeness and completeness for the first time in history, it's enacted and realized. It's beautiful, isn't it? But let me see if I can press the beauty a little closer to home. This wonderful greeting, peace be with you. When Jesus comes and says, peace be with you, I ask you, did the disciples deserve this Warm and full greeting. Did they deserve it? Just moments before, Peter swore curses upon himself, denying Jesus three times. Just moments before, the disciples all fled from Christ when he was hanging on the cross. They all deserted him. And so I ask you, what would we have said to the disciples if we were in Jesus' shoes? Would we have said, peace be with you? Would, would we not have said, I loved you guys unto death, and yet you deserted me? In my great hour of need, you ran? Explain yourselves. How, how could you do that? And even now, Mary has told you that she has seen me and given the message to you. And what do you do? You lock the doors of your house, fear and trembling. You faithless men, unfaithful and faithless. Does Jesus do that? No, he doesn't. He, he, he doesn't. You don't see him storm that house as a judge. And you do not see him storm that house with a sword in his hand. He comes to them in precious, precious words. He says to them, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Christian, you have heard those sweet words, haven't you, from the Lord's lips? You have, haven't you? We had denied him. We were the ones who have deserted him. He should have swung the sword against us, but what happened? A sword was substituted for a kiss of peace. A kiss of peace. And he did not come to us as judge But he came to us and said to us, peace, peace be to you. Precious, precious Lord Jesus, precious Lord Jesus, there is nothing that compares in this world to hearing those words, peace be with you, from the lips of the Prince of Peace. There's nothing like it. And so it says in verse 20, then he showed them his hands and his side. 
his nail-pierced hands and his spear-driven side. He shows them. Do you understand? The peace he gives us is bound up in his scars. We have peace because of his scars, because of his wounds. And when he shows them his wounds and his scars, it says in verse 20, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They were overjoyed. See, do you, do you possess this peace with God? Do you possess this peace with God through Jesus Christ? Do you know it? Because even tonight, he can say to you, as he spoke to the storm and the raging wind, he said, peace, be still. He can say to your heart, even tonight, peace, be still. Peace be with you. He calls you to believe, to trust in him and to turn from your self-righteousness and throw yourself upon him in faith, taking him as Savior and Lord. And he will whisper to your heart, peace be with you. Forgive all of your sins. Let me draw this to a close uh, really um, with a final point here. Let me draw this uh, to a close. Verses, uh, verses 21 Uh, onwards Jesus says peace be with you as the father sent me I'm sending you and with that he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive anyone his sins they are forgiven if you do not forgive them they are not forgiven now there's so much here but I need to rush through it because we're out of time these are really tricky words here but notice if we get the progression we understand what Jesus says He says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. In the Gospels, Jesus is the sent one. The Father is the sender. Jesus is sent and the Father is the sender. But now we see the sent one, Jesus. The sent one becomes the sender. This is showing us this sending, all of this sending work. Our God is a missional God. He's all about mission. He is sending. The different members of the Trinity are sending. They have a mission. And Jesus says, now I am sending you. As I was sent by God and did what he told me to do, spoke what he spoke and accomplished what he said, now I'm sending you. Speak what what I've told you to speak and do what I tell you to do. His mission was to teach and to secure uh, atonement for forgiveness of sins. Our mission is to now proclaim his death, resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. God is missional and now he sends us out. He sends us out. This is our privilege. So this is the great commission from John's angle. From John's angle. But look at verse 22 now. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, this, so, there's so much speculation around this verse. Uh, there's so many interpretations. I don't want to spend, can't spend long on it. It says, He breathed upon them. He literally breathed and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. All I want to say is there is a great element of symbolism here. The Holy Spirit in the scriptures is compared and and portrayed as the breath of God. Spirit means wind, air, breath. So it's not literally that or or fully in a literal sense that literally um, Jesus' breath is the Holy Spirit. Whenever Jesus breathes, that's the Holy Spirit coming out of his mouth or his nostrils. That's not the case. There's obviously symbolism here. What, there is some kind of imparting of the Spirit here, but this isn't a full impartation of the Holy Spirit. It's definitely not. And there's a few reasons for this. Because in John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit after he's ascended. He hasn't ascended yet. So it can't be this full promise of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, just before the moment before he ascends into heaven, he says to them, wait for the gift my Father promised you, the one I spoke of, the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit hadn't been sent yet. 
And so even here, there's, there's the evidence that Pentecost was the full imparting of the Spirit. I mean, they can't have received the full uh, portion of the Spirit here, uh, this great work of the Spirit. It, it can't be, because as soon as this encounter happens, the disciples don't know what to do. They're still fearful. They get locked behind. They lock themselves in the room again. And then even after that, they go back to fishing. On the sea, they don't know what to do. They just go back to the old trade. But after Pentecost, they become preachers and they become fishers of men. No longer fear to, fear, fearful of the Jews, but bold as lions. So what's going on here? This is a foretaste of, of the spirit that is going to come on them. They need to know that the mission that they're going to embark on is, is going to be accomplished. The resource that they're given is going to be the Holy Spirit sent from Jesus. It's a foretaste. And then see how this flows into the final verse. Verse 23. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now again, this seems like such a puzzling verse and there's speculation, but not when you keep it in flow. This needs to be interpreted, interpreted in context. Catholics abuse this passage. They take this and say that priests and bishops have the authority to absolve people of their sins. That's blasphemy. That is blasphemy. It's not what the passage is saying here. You never see in Acts the disciples or the apostles forgiving people of their sins. What's Jesus saying here? What, what is he saying here? Well, the context is evangelism. This verse has to understood in, be understood in light of evangelism. He's sending them out. As he was sent, we are sent out. And he's commissioning them. And he's commissioning them in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why that verse is there. By the Spirit. So it has to be tied to evangelism. What does it mean then? What does the verse mean? When sharing the gospel... When we share the gospel, when we evangelize, we are announcing the terms of the kingdom of heaven. We're announcing the terms. We promise people the forgiveness of sins if they believe and turn to Christ in faith. We make that promise. That's the terms of the kingdom. But we also declare and pronounce anyone who does not receive our message of the gospel, their sin remains on them and God's anger remains on them. So we make the promise, all those who believe and accept your sins will be forgiven. We announce that if the heart is true. But we also have the authority to announce if you do not accept this message, your sin remains on your head. You are guilty and the judgment of God is ready to fall upon you any moment. See, by Jesus sending us and giving the Spirit, He is delegating authority, being brought into the mission of God. To announce these things, you have the authority to declare these things. Let me really close here by quoting Spurgeon on this. He says, this is Jesus saying to us, quote, I will back up your ministry. When you preach that men are condemned for sin of which they have not repented, I will make it to be so as a matter of fact. When you declare pardon to all who trust in my precious blood, I will make it so. That truth which you preach shall have my seal of approval set upon it. My power shall go, go forth with your proclamation of the truth so that it shall be seen that you are not proclaiming a fiction. When you preach my gospel, I will remit the sins of all who believe it. And when you pronounce sentence of condemnation on such as remain in unbelief, I will confirm, I will confirm your declaration. End quote. We've been entrusted to give the terms of the kingdom of heaven when we share the gospel. So I close and I say to you, do you, do you believe? Do you take Christ to be your Lord and Savior, repent and believe in the crucified and raised Savior who appeared? Do you cast yourself upon him in faith and receive him? For all those, the promise from the scriptures is the forgiveness of sins over your life. Peace be with you is the promise that God gives but also with the authority that God gives me even now evangelizing. I can say if you refuse, if you continue in sin and to serve sin and self, living your own way, not turning unto Christ and believing on, on him, then your guilt remains and the judgment of God hangs upon your head. Your sin is retained. It remains upon you. By the authority of God, I announce that. So these are the terms here. What will you do with the one 
who announces and offers peace with God. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for these precious words, uh, these precious words that are found in this passage. There's so much here, Lord. There's just so much uh, to think about. But God, I pray that you would draw our hearts out to these precious truths, wonderful truths. Christ, our elder brother, Peace with you, our blessed privilege, our blessed privileges. And even now that you have brought us into the very mission of God, that you've given us of the Spirit and you're sending us forth, giving us authority in your name based upon your word and the gospel of your Son. Thank you for these things. Lord, cause us to receive these truths. And God, I pray that the lost would believe on the Prince of Peace, the one who announces peace. May they believe on him even tonight. Oh God, thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Lord. We worship you in the name of your Son. Amen. Well, just after this video, there will be a song uh, that's included that ties in with this message. And I, and I trust and I'm sure that it will bring great encouragement as you sing it uh, with whoever you are now with watching. Uh, and can I encourage you to discuss and think over these things that we've considered that the word may dwell richly in your, in your heart. And so may the Lord uh, be with you and may his peace be with you. Amen. Amen.